happy anniversary, Discovery Church, man. We got a cake to celebrate our anniversary. Turn to your neighbor and tell them happy five years. Come on, Discovery. 4,949 salvations. Every Sunday at Discovery Church, we have given an opportunity for people to commit their life to Jesus, surrender their life as Lord and Savior. But look, every number is a name, and every name has a, has a story. How many believe that God is still writing the story and the best is yet to come? We're just getting started, amen? That there is still more breakthrough, there are still more miracles, not only in Discovery, but in our lives, in your lives. God has more in store, amen? Come on, let's lift our faith, lift our hands, and believe God that the best is yet to come. Breakthrough is coming. Welcome to Discovery Church once again. We're celebrating our five-year anniversary. God has done some awesome, just some amazing, miraculous things in five years. If you're new to Discovery, I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Today, we, we're celebrating this anniversary, but we also use it as, this, as an annual vision casting service. And today's a special one because we're closing this chapter of five years of what God has done. And we're actually opening up um, a new chapter of just believing God for even greater things, you guys. And it's so crazy because we're just, we're just getting started. 4,949 salvations in just five years is amazing. But, but I cannot reiterate that every number is a name, you guys. And every, every name is a story. And we've highlighted a lot of those stories even on social media all week, highlighting different stories. And Chaz's testimony is just one of the many. And I love her testimony. Because the, my favorite part was where she couldn't even really articulate. She says, it's not like stuff is still bad and there's still dark times, stuff like that. But she said that she has a different perspective in it. That, and, and that's what God offers. God doesn't offer to change your circumstances and your situations, but he will change you. He'll, he'll change you from the inside out. And that's what she was explaining that, man, yeah, there's still tough times. And I even need to reach out for support sometimes, but I am different. That I have purpose in the midst of it that gives me the ability to withstand. And I just, man, I love what God is doing. I think there's more marriages that are going to be restored. Amen. There's more lives going to be saved. More addictions and addicts are going to be set free. There is going to be so much more that God will do in this next five years. And the invitation to like freedom in life, it goes to everybody. It's God. God invites all to come, but not everyone responds to the call. Not everyone says yes to the call of God. And there's a parable in Luke chapter 14 that Jesus talks about this, this picture, this story. It was an illustration of how just not everybody responds to this call that went out to everyone. Look, with it, look at it with me in Luke 14. It says, a man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, come on in. You don't, need to, you don't need to get dressed right. You don't need to fix, your, fix yourself up. It's okay. Just, just come on, come on. Just as you are, come. The banquet is ready. It's good to go. But they all began doing what? Making excuses. Yeah, we've heard them, you know. I just, I can't do it. It's not time. I'm not ready. The church will burn down when I get there. All that kind of stuff that we've heard and we've even said. There's just all kinds of excuses. Why not to respond to the invitation? That God offers, and some of them, he said, one said, I, I just bought a field, and I got inspected, I got some financial things, excuse me, and the other said, I, I just bought five pairs of oxen, and so I'm a farmer, I got some career things going on, and, and I want to try them out, so please excuse me, and still another said, I just got married, so I got this relationship that's important, it's, it's just more important than my relationship with you, God, and what you got going on there, I can't respond, I can't come. And the servant returned and told his master what everyone said. And look how the master responded. His master was furious. And he said, fine then. Go quickly into, and I love this about God. This is where, this is, he said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town 
and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. What he's saying is it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, how many divorces you have, what kind of addictions you have. It doesn't matter. The invitation is for you. Come. Come. Jesus wants. And I, I, we actually put a modern day version of this invitation to the wedding banquet on the back of the welcome cards that we give out every week. It's actually on the back on the top of the welcome card. We kind of just had a modern day. It says this. It's actually on the back of your card, but it says, we don't care how you're dressed or how many tattoos you have or who, what candidate you voted for. We're a church full of broken. Amen, somebody? Amen. Imperfect people. Amen, somebody? With every kind of story imaginable, and we're saving a seat for you. Welcome to Discovery Church. That's what God's church is supposed to look like, you guys. It honestly is. And I saw this woman. It was actually two weeks ago. I was coming down the aisle right here to go to my usual seat. And she was seeing, she saw this card. And she was reading it. And, I, and she was showing her husband. And I passed by her and heard what she said. She said, look, honey, it says tattoos. It was, and he's all tatted up and stuff like that. And I talked to her and her husband and the family. I had kids with them and stuff out in the lobby. Come to find out, she was a Christian, was uh, attending church for many years, but got saved or got got married, hasn't been to church in over 10 years. This was the first time her husband had ever been in church, and she said, hey, honey. She was just so excited to go, hey, look, this church is for you. And I'm like, yeah, buddy, you, it's for you. We're saving a seat for you. You belong here. It doesn't matter who you are and what your story is. All of us have a different kind of story and a story to tell, but that's what God's church that's what God's house was always supposed to look like and that's why King David was so passionate about God's house look what King David said and this is honestly this is like like my heart for God's house burns like this my love for your house he says burns in me like a fire like I'm just so in love with your house with your church with your temple God I'm so on fire with it and as we celebrate five years and we look back and we see all the things that God has done, and it truly has been amazing. Our creative team was like generating different stories, and they had some different photos of our journey, and they asked me for like a little synopsis of the different landmarks, and so I was typing up different things, and as I, I was just blown away at the five years at what God has done as we pause and just reflect back. Actually, three months ago, I got a call from Lifeway. You know the Christian store, Lifeway? Not that one, the, the, the conglomerate organization, Lifeway Research Group, they called me here at the church and they said, hey, we want to feature Discovery Church in our October magazine because you are one of the fastest growing churches in the United States of America. Come on, is God good? Just crazy. And so we're just kind of going, you know, urging people to come into the house and stuff like that and inviting people to come. And, but as I look back and reflect, I'm like, wow, God, this is supernatural. This is miraculous. This is just not normal or average. It's awesome. And we're just getting started. We're just getting started. So my question to you, Discovery, you, my question to you is, what kind of house will we build for the Lord? Like what kind of, hey, look, we, we've seen what God has done, but what is it going to be? What kind of house and this is honestly, it is a twofold question because you yourself are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the house of God. So what kind, what kind of house are you going to build in the next five years? What kind of, what are you going to believe God for, for your life, for your family? What are, what faith steps are you going to take? What kind of house are you going to build for God? What is it going to look like? What are you going to believe him for? And then the, the, the twofold part of this, the second part is discovery. We are the house of God. And I'm not talking about the drywall and insulation. The only, hey, this is special and God uses it. It really is. But the only reason why it's special is because we, the church, the house of God, decided to, to park here. Decided to, to meet here and to honor God here and to exalt God here. That's why his presence is here because we are the house of God. So what kind of house will we build for the Lord, Discovery Church? And as I prayed about that, and I said, God, how can, what do you have for us in this next five years? 
and, and, and I met with our leaders, and we went over this fi- the five years and all the different things that God has done, and it just has been awesome. But God, I believe, is going to do even greater things. And that's honestly been the mantra of our first five years. We've had these greater things, vision, goals. Um, and I believe, yeah, we, we believe God for greater things. We'll continue to believe Him for greater things. But the Lord put on my heart that, that we need to develop, like, like David, a heart for the house. That, that it needs to, something needs to burn in our heart for God and for his house in order for God to do what he wants to do in the next five years at Discovery Church. So I want to stretch your faith again, Discovery, and cast some vision of the next five years at Discovery Church of what, what are the new goals that God is putting before us? What's the new, what, what, where are we going, Discovery? What kind of house will we, we, will we build for the Lord? I want to give you Three big goals that will be the focus of our next five years together. Take some notes with me. I want you to write them down and get ready to just stretch your faith and believe with me, church, once more. Here's the first goal of a heart for the house is what we're calling it. Number one, we're believing God for a new property, a new, we're calling it discovery headquarters. So that's going to be, yes, the, lo- the new location. We're believing God for a new location of Discovery Church Southwest, a location that's going to seat 12. Come on, somebody say parking spaces. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. <laughs> I know where you're walking from. I saw you parking at the DMV. God loves you. God bless you. Thank you for parking at the DMV. Man, but I want, I want you just to give you a picture of, because we're working with the, the architects and drawing it up of what the house could look like. But it's not just going to be for Discovery Church Southwest. This is going to be a headquarters for the central operations of our network. That we're going to train leaders and send pastors from this campus right here. Which, I'm so excited to announce to you, we have a license for our Discovery Leadership College to offer us accredited associates and bachelor's degrees. Starting fall of 2019... We're partnering with um, Southeastern University for that. We're actually starting, it, you're going to hear more about that. Registrations and all that stuff is coming up later this year. But this is, this is going to be the factory, you guys. There's going to be kids' facilities. We're going to start a preschool here. Separate youth facilities, separate so they're meeting in their own location. Amen, got youth here. Praise the Lord. I'm really, oh, cafe, bookstore. Come on, come on, come on espresso, somebody, espresso. It's right there. That's the cafe right there, somebody. That's it. That's the, that's the bookstore. Right. Amen. Hey, someone drink, like some coffee. Amen. But we're believing God for it. In the next five years, you guys, we're going to see it. Now, we're working with our trustees of Discovery Church. We put in offers at different pieces of land. Nothing has happened, but I truly, I, I believe that God is protecting us and preserving the right location for his church. Amen, Discovery? So that's the first, that's our first goal that really is going to help launch us to a whole new level of ministry and and, and planting churches all across our nation, which actually leads us to the second goal of a heart for the house, which is church planting. Now, you guys know from the very beginning, we said, hey, we're going to be a church planting church. In fact, we made a goal that seemed audacious then. It doesn't seem so audacious now. We said we're going to plant 10 churches in 10 years. Five years into it, we got four churches, four campuses of Discovery Church. How many of you believe we got six more in five years in us, huh? <laughs> Amen. How many of you believe, Pastor, we got more than that in us? Come on, somebody. Who's with it? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I believe. And I, I believe there's more in our region. In, the, in Kern County, there's more, there's more campuses that we can start in Kern County that need a life-giving Discovery Church. There's more campuses in the region of, of the Tri-County area where we launched Camarillo, Venturia, Tri, Tri-City area. There's more. There's more. There's more room. And there's even new regions that God is going to send us to in Jesus' name to start new discovery churches, that's, that's, just, that's just one of the, one of the goals, one of the big anchors. We're saying, hey, a new headquarters, a new, a new location for Southwest and a headquarters for our entire network. We're going to plant churches. We're going to continue to do that. And number three, we are going to be about our Dream Centers, church. We've launched this Dream Center in Bakersfield in October of last year and already have seen so much life change and transformation and impact in our city and the lives of the people in our inner city. And what we, what we have sought out to do, our, our mission, our, our promise is that every place that we plant in a new region, a Discovery Church, we're going to erect a Dream Center. So the next Dream Center that is coming is Dream Center Oxnard. 
Dream Snare and Oxnard is going to come to Ventura County, and that'll be coming soon. And, and we're just, we're believing God that we're going to expand the Dream Center operation as well as our Discovery Church network, planting churches, a new location for Southwest and headquarters. Now, who's going to stand in agreement with me and say, amen, let it be so, Pastor Jason. Come on, let me see some affirmation by your hand. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. By your witness, let's, let's believe it together. Amen. Give God some praise, church. Amen. I'm really excited um, for this next chapter. I really am. I really believe everything else was just a setup to do what God wants to do in this next five years. But I believe a, a, developing a heart for the house is going to be integral for us to get there. And so there's, let me give you three reasons why, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how you can have a heart for the house and what it develops in your life. I want to show you that, but let me just give you, start off with three reasons why I have a heart for the house and why I think you should have a heart for the house as well. Here's the first reason why. Write it down, because there is hope in the house. There is hope in the house. There is, there is actually no other place that you can find this hope. The author of Hebrews says, this hope is an anchor for my soul. It's the only thing that can keep me firm and secure. There is hope in the house. And I'm not, I, I, the world's got it wrong. I looked up in the Webster's Dictionary what hope is, and the world has got it, let me just, has got it wrong. One of the synonyms and definitions was wishful thinking. This isn't the kind of hope that God is talking about when, he's, when he says that there's hope. When I'm telling you hope is in the house, that's not the kind of hope. And you know what wishful thinking is, right? It's this pie in the sky thing. It's like, I don't have no absolute way how it's going to happen, but I just hope. I just it's, it's blowing out the candles, I hope I get a Porsche kind of thing, right? It's the hope that a lot of you are having for your football team the first Sunday of the season. You know what I'm saying? Oh, this is my year for the Niners or the Cowboys or whatever. Where are the jerseys at? Where are the jerseys? You guys are wearing them today. They're all over the place. It's, it, you know what? You're just wishful thinking, all right? I'm hoping too. I'm hoping, but that's not the hope we're talking about. Another definition of hope that the the world has it was another synonym was blind optimism no that is that is the not the hope that i'm talking about is in the house you don't act like it doesn't exist all right oh just just hey just be positive just don't be negative be positive think positive everything will work out for you i'm sorry it just doesn't work out that way all the time okay that's not the hope that uh, that that god has to offer you acting like it doesn't exist is not really hope. It's like I read this week. There was someone put up a poster in a grocery store and it said, lost dog. Please return if found. Blind in the right eye, left ear torn off, has a missing leg and a broken tail and has recently been castrated in answers to the name Lucky. <laughs> I don't care what you say. I don't care how optimistic that dog is. Lucky ain't lucky. Okay. He just, he just ain't lucky. All right. Here's, here's what the hope that's in the house. This is the biblical definition of hope. Hope is a confident expectation. It's, it's the evidence, the substance, you guys, of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen based on something solid. Yeah, there's some intangibility to it, like it's still future, but it's some, it has a basis to it. I can grab hold of this hope. It is an anchor for my soul. Look what Psalm 62 verse 5 says. Find rest, O my soul, in one place, in God alone. My hope can only come from Him. Hey, church, why, you, why we need to have a heart for the house? Because there is hope. The hope that you're looking for, the hope that you need, the hope that's going to be the anchor for your life can only be found in the house. Amen, church? Here's the second reason why we need to develop a heart for the house. Number two, there is power in the house. That God always intended for signs and wonders and miracles to follow his church, to follow his disciples, to follow them who would believe that there is power in God's house. Power. When, when Peter confessed, when Jesus asked the disciples, hey, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Messiah. Jesus told him about the power of the church, didn't he? He said, hey, man, upon, Peter, upon that confession, of, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because there is power in the house. There was always meant to be power in the house. Um, look here at Psalm 71. 
There's power to heal, power to restore, power to redeem, power to save. Psalm 71 says, oh God, let me proclaim your power, not just so I can experience it. It's great to experience miracles and power, but let me proclaim your power to what? Church, let's have a story to tell. Let's have a story to tell a new generation that, that the legacy of our life, that, that what will they say of Discovery Church in years to come? What, what story will we tell a new generation of God's power and His mighty miracles to all who come after us? Discovery Church, I want a story that has God's power written all over it in Discovery Church. Amen? This is, this is the way it was meant to be. God wants His church to flow and operate in power so that we can tell a new generation and by and large in america at least this generation is 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 getting lost not here at discovery church but by and large in america now overseas in other places the church is rapidly growing but there is there's something we we need to change here in the states i was doing some research and and found out that four out of five churches are either plateaued or declining today Four out of five. Five thousand, it said five thousand churches close their doors every year. Me meaning 96 today. Hey, while we're celebrating five years of God's greater things and faithfulness, today 96 churches are having their farewell, farewell service. It's so sad. Uh, and all the while, the population, the church is like not keeping up with the population growth. Check out this graph, you guys. Just to show you the population growth by the billions, it starts off here at, at zero, at Jesus. It's actually just around a few years around where Jesus made the declaration to Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And, and the highlighted portion over here represents about our lifetime. Something has happened in our lifetime. The, it's exponential population growth by the billions by the billions and by and large the church is not keeping up and do you want to know why i think one of the main reasons one of the reasons why in america the church is not keeping up i don't mean to ruffle any feathers i just think this is one of the reasons there's no power in the house there was always meant to be power in the house there was always meant to be to, the power of God to break through in people's lives, a tangible force that people would say, I have met God. That was always God's design. In fact, in Acts, he spells it out. In Acts, he said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's, that's, this is the launch of the church. This is, well, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you so that you can be my witness. And without that power... We're just not a good witness. It was always God's design, though, for us, for there to be power in the house, power in the house. There's hope in the house. And here's my favorite part of God's house. It's one of the reasons why I have a heart for the house. It's the third reason, because there's enough room in the house. How many, how many, Billy, there's enough room in the house. There's still seats that are empty. There's still more room for people to come and enjoy God's house. Look what the servant said. Back to Luke chapter 14. The servant goes back to the master after the servant had done all this. So he went to the poor, the crippled, the lame. He went to, he went to the streets and the alleys and he urged them to come in. And he reported, hey, but God, there's still what? Room for more. There's still room for more, God, to which God, the master, replies, okay, go out then into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone one translation says compel them so so go compel them church to come go go out to northwest and compel them to come go out to oxnard and compel them to come go out to union go out to your neighbors go out to your workplace go out and compel them to come anyone you would find god says so my house will be full there is enough room in the house and i love this about god god values every single person the bible says he leaves the 99 for the one and there's still the one great 4,949 fantastic that's beautiful and i celebrate with you and i love it but there's still the one there's still the one that's there's still enough room in the house for more so whether you're new to the house of god or maybe you've gotten comfortable in god's house 
you need to understand something. Please listen. Listen, there's a huge difference between going to church and being planted in the house. Are you with me, church? I need you to see this. If you're going to have a heart for the house, you gotta, we, we got to move away from our, our, our cultural mindset of what church looks like. There's a huge difference between attending and going to church and being planted in the house. Let me show you what having a heart for the house looks like. Back here in, in Psalm, it says, planted in the house of our Lord. That's what it looks like. I had one person I met with uh, just this last week. He's a truck driver, and he was using a truck analogy, and he said, hey, we're... I'm, I'm looking for a church. We've been looking for years. I'm looking for a church to park my family at. And I said, wait a second. We don't, we don't park in the house of God. That's, that's, can I, there are so many people who are just parked in, in, in the house of God. Like, like you, just, you just put it in park, and you can easily put it back in reverse and go park somewhere, somewhere else. Look, God says, you want to have a heart for the house? The only way that, you know why? Because planted, planted, you grow roots. And you need that. You need those roots to do what? To bear fruit. Because only when you're planted in the house of the Lord will they flourish. They'll be fruitful. You will abound. It will be abundant life in the courts of our God. Planted in the house of God. You were made to flourish. You were made to have this deep, intimate uh, a relationship with God, a faith that is uh, unshakable, a life that is abundant and full. Do you believe that? That's what, that's what Jesus actually promised, that you would have an abundant, full life. He promised it in John chapter 10, verse 10. He actually made two promises here. He says, the thief comes, let me promise, he, I'll make you a promise. The thief is going to come into your life to try to steal and kill and destroy, which a lot of us buy into that hook, line, and sinker because we are not finding our hope in God. We put our hope in other things, and they fail us, and all it does is steal, kill, and destroy us. But he says, hey, but I have come. Here's a promise. I have come that you might have life, and you would have it to the full. That in, in another translation, it says that you would have an abundant, full life. God designed you to flourish. Having a heart for the house is about being planted in the house. At Discovery, we say it looks like this. When you have a heart for the house, it looks like this. You love God passionately. You love each other authentically. And you change, you, you'll go make a difference and change the world for the cause of Christ. That's what it means to have a heart for the house. It means God's priorities are my priorities. His mission is my mission. His, his, his vision is my vision. I, I'm not going to live to myself. I'm going to live God's purpose. And this is what I honestly believe God's purpose is for our life. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He could not give one. He had to give them two. He said, the greatest? Well, I can't give you one. I need to give you Two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I believe when you do that, we, at Discovery, we believe when you do that, you will make a difference for Christ. You will change. And although one of us can't really make that big of an impact, Discovery, I believe that together we can change the world. Amen, somebody? I believe it. I hope you're a bot into this and you can develop a passion, a heart for God's house. I'm telling you, you do this. You do that. I promise you, you will flourish in the house of God. You will, you will abound. You will, not, you will not be lacking in breakthrough, in miracles following your life if you make God's vision your vision. Amen? So let me show you what it looks like now to be planted. This is what happens. This is what is produced, that fruit that is produced from being planted, from having a heart for the house. Write them down because loving God produces this. It keeps me centered. It's a relationship with God that is actually going to center my life. And a lot of people try to find their center of gravity, their meaning, their significance. They try to put their hope in things that are not God. My, so you put your hope in your money or in a relationship or in your career or in these other things. And they do not produce the anchor you need. They don't center your soul like your soul so desires to be centered. It can't. It was always designed to have a relationship with God. It's the only thing that will center you. Yeah, when you, you're out, you can put your hope in other things, and some seasons will feel good. 
No, yeah, they will. Some seasons will even feel right. You know, a, a clock that doesn't even work is right two times a day. Amen. Okay, so sometimes it's going to feel like this, is, but it will not. I'm telling you, it will not center your life. A relationship with God, choosing faith is the only thing that'll center you. It's the only thing that'll complete you. It's, the, it's what your heart yearns for. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25 says, anyone who keeps his life for himself. So if you, still, if you try to find your completion, your significance, if you try to put your hope in these other things to yourself, he says, you'll lose it every time. The enemy will steal, kill, and destroy. You'll lose it. But if anyone loses his life, meaning just surrender the control, Jesus is saying, for me, you'll find it again. You will center your life. It is only found in a relationship with Jesus. So here's what I want to do in, in, in all three of these steps. I want to help you identify a next step for you. So in your outline, there's, there's a blank. There's just one blank. But what I want to do is I want to give you, I want to offer you Three possible next step commitments for you to make, for you to develop a heart for the house, for you to get planted in the house of God. Maybe you need to make some commitments, make some steps today. So let me offer you three. If it's a step that you need to take and you just feel in your heart like this is this is for me, write it down right there in your notes, because maybe your next step is just to commit your life to Jesus. Maybe that's something you need to write down. Maybe it's something you really haven't done or that you walked away from and you need to... You're hearing the call to come, the invitation to freedom and to life and to be a part of the party of what God is doing. But it's time to respond to it and stop making excuses about it. And maybe it's just to commit there. And, and by the way, we have baptisms coming up in two weeks. Maybe that's a next step for some of you, that a public declaration and demonstration that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe your next step is just maybe to commit to Sunday. Maybe, maybe it's just to prioritize your heart for the house, because it's one thing to say we have a heart for the house, but it's another thing to keep it as a priority, say, you know what, I'm going to show up. I'm going to be, which, by the way, can I tell you, um, we're starting a new series next week called Quit Church. So I'm, uh, come back to church next Sunday, I'll teach you how to quit church. <laughs> so here's, listen, because I really, I truly believe that there are so many people that need to quit their idea of what church is and what a relationship of God is supposed to be. You got to quit all that in order to take on the real deal of what church is supposed to be and a relationship with God is supposed to be. So come back next Sunday and quit church, <laughs> okay? Um, yeah, no, seriously, it's going to be great. I'm a it's going to be a really challenging series to really shift some things, some paradigms of what you think your relationship, because a lot of people think it's about do's and don'ts and rules, and, and, and a lot of people do think it's about attendance or something. It ain't about all that. It's not about all that. Come back next week, and I'll show you what it, what it is about. Maybe this is your next step, to commit to giving. To commit to giving. Now, this is, uh, Jesus says that wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So maybe, maybe I got, yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. I ain't even come on Sundays very often, but... The reason why your heart shifts and why you're a wave tossed by the sea is because you haven't invested in the house. So your heart hasn't followed it. I mean, that's what Jesus said. Jesus says your, your heart follows where your investment goes. And maybe that's a next step for some of you to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get planted in the house of God and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give. So that's, that's the first commitment. Loving God centers you. Here's the, the second commitment you guys that we want to make having a heart for the house looks like loving each other and what that does in our life is it keeps us connected because you were not only made for a relationship with God you were designed for a relationship with others there is no two ways about it you cannot have an authentic relationship with God that is growing and vibrant without a relationship with other people you, you just can't you, there is no such thing as hermit Christians there isn't God called you to community he called us to life together. Listen, he called you to the house. He called you to the house. Look at these scriptures right here. Matthew, or John 15, 12. He says this. Jesus says, my command is this, and this is just where we get our purpose statement. Love each other as I have loved you. That's what I, I want you to do. Actually, it, it's love and loving each other. This whole connection thing is, the Bible says, it's the proof that you even know Jesus. It, it, it's not how much Bible you know. It's not how much, you know, how long you've been going to church. 
It's not how smart you are, how intellectual. How, it's none of those. None of that is the proof that you've passed from death to life. Look at 1 John. 1 John says, we know that we have passed from death to life. We have, we have been saved, set free. I am no longer a slave to sin. We know that that has happened because we what? We love each other. That's how we know. And anyone, he goes on to say, that doesn't love remains in death. I don't care how much church you get, how much Bible you get. If you don't have love, the Bible says you're just a noise. The Bible says you're just a clank, clanking gong, okay? It's meaningless and worthless unless you, uh, unless you love each other. So let me give you some next steps. Let me give you some commitments. If you want to be planted in the house of the Lord, if you want to flourish and develop this heart for the house, then maybe your next step is to commit to a small group. Maybe that's it. May, the small groups just launched last week. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you're in a, in a place where, hey, you've never been to a small group or in a Christian community where people are trying to grow together and honor God together and sharpen each other. And you need to take that step, man. We just, they stay open all season and they're, they're, they run about 12, 13 weeks long, jump into a small group. And I know that's kind of scary for a lot of people, the whole small group thing, because like I'm going to develop relationships with like 8, 10, 12, 20 new people. Oh my gosh. And it's, it is a little bit leery for a lot of people. But think about it this way. Don't just commit to a small group. Maybe your next step is just to commit to someone. So you don't need to be best buds with 12 or 20 people, but, but you need to find someone. You know how the, the Bible says, you know how you make friends? You be a friend. That's what Proverbs says. You be a friend. So you need to be a friend to somebody. Some of you have probably even voiced that complaint. Oh, I ain't got no friends. No, I don't know anybody. Have you, have you made yourself a friend to somebody? So don't just commit to a small group. You don't need to be bu best buzz with everybody, but commit to someone. And then this might be a next step for some of you here today. Hey, commit to open up. Commit to open up. Just maybe there's a secret that you have that no one else knows, but you're reminded of in your dark times. Listen, you can't really have a heart that is burning for God a heart for his house and burning for God if there's a part of your heart that's hidden from him. If you're, just, if you're neglecting to address some of those things, and it, it is, it's, it's going to be a, 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 a blockage in your artery from what God wants to do in your life. Some of you just need to commit to opening up. It, it, see, loving each other keeps you connected. Loving God, it keeps you um, centered and then this third part of our purpose, we just say changing the world, that keeps us compassionate. Compassionate. I mean, Jesus looked onto, it says this multitude of people, and he said he was moved with compassion. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Can I tell you something? This right here is why we exist. If you know Jesus, this is your job description right here. Until Jesus comes back, this is what the church should be doing, making a difference and changing the world for the cause of Christ. Look, I'm, I'm excited for heaven too. Heaven's going to be great. It's going to be like no crying, no death, no sorrow. It's going to be fantastic. Our mansion, woohoo, all that good stuff. But as long as I'm here, as long as discovery is here until Jesus returns, we're going to hustle for the one. Come on, amen, somebody. We're going to hustle for the one because they're still out there. The sons and daughters are, are still out there. So maybe your next step, 2 Corinthians, let me read this scripture first. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4 actually says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what his name is. He's the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. See, he, he comforted us in all of our troubles. He, he comforted us in our, in our issues, in our you know, addictions and our brokenness. He gave us comfort, but it wasn't just so that we could be comfortable. There was a so that. You were saved so that. You were comforted so that. God showed you compassion and mercy so that we can do it for others. That's why. That's why you were comforted. That's why you were saved. That's why you were set free. Comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So, your next step, let me give you a few of them, maybe is to commit to the dream team. The dream team is just that team of people that is 
making a difference here at Discovery. They've found their gifts and they're using it as part of a team. We actually have step two today at 4.30. Dinner and child care is provided. If you want to get planted in the house of God and join the dream team and start serving God, come today. You're invited. You don't have to go to step one. You didn't have to. I mean, go to that. You can come today at 4.30. We'll show you what your spiritual gifts are. If you don't know that, your spiritual gifts, your personality, and we'll get you connected to a team. Or maybe your next step, I would encourage everyone here to commit to outreach, to be a part of what we're doing outside of the walls at the Dream Center and our outreach groups. We have a lot of monthly outreaches that we do. Be a part of that. The last thing, maybe I would encourage every one of you, commit to being an inviter. Like, like Jesus said, urge them, go out to the streets, into the alleys and compel them. Come, anyone who would come, you belong here. We're saving a seat for you. Hey, Discovery, we're just getting started. This is just the beginning, man. I hope that your faith is stirred. I hope that you can see pictures of our future. I hope that you can see this miraculous story that God not only has written, but will write. So let me, let me leave you with this, Discovery Church. Ephesians chapter 2, I love this part of the Bible. It says, God is building a home. How many, let me, hey, guys, I'm not building this church. We're not building this church. Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail. See, if I build it, it's not going to last, guys. If you, if we build it, it's not going to last. But thank God is building his house. Amen? And he's using us all irrespective of how we got here. I mean, it doesn't matter how you got here. It doesn't matter what addictions and hangups and issues or how many times you've been divorced or how many times you fell down. Irrespective of how we got here and what he's building, he used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. But now he's using you. See, you're the modern day of prophets. You're the modern day apostles that God is establishing his house, fitting you in brick by brick by brick brick by stone by stone by stone by stone with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together and we see it we see it taking shape and we've seen it for five years taking shape day by day and I've seen it it's been one of the just the, the greatest privilege of my life to pastor this church and to pastor you and to see it taking shape and to see your lives being changed and the steps that you've taken, I see it day after day. A holy temple built by God. All of us built into it. And this is my hope, Discovery Church, that it would be a house in which God is quite at home. A house at Discovery where God looks at Discovery and says, I want to be there. I'm at home in that place. My presence can rest that place. Amen, Discovery? Hey, let's bow our heads. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we just thank you so much. We ask that this would forever and always be a place that you are quite at home, that your presence would rest in power and glory here, that there would be hope in your house, that it's found here, God, experienced here, God, that there's power in your house, that miracles and breakthroughs and signs and wonders would follow your church wherever we go, that it would follow us, God. Power, God, and there is enough room that your heart is still for the lost, the broken, the hurting, that don't know you. And there's room. God, we're saving a seat for them. We're preparing for them. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're here today and you're, you are one of the one. And you know it, man, that God has been inviting you to come. He's been giving you the invitation to come. And maybe in the past you've made some excuses. But I'm going to encourage you today to accept the invitation. Like it's not what you probably thought it was. You don't need to fix yourself up or clean yourself. God just... He just wants a relationship with you. And through that relationship, He will change you from the inside out. He will build it inside of you. 